welcome everyone uh, to this webinar. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Tarek Alana. I'm the Associate Director of Art Heritage. Uh, as we near the conclusion of our ongoing ceramics exhibition, sh Shape Shifting Fluid Geometries and Ceramics, our, uh, on May 18th, I'm thrilled to moderate Kiln Conversation. This webinar marks the second parallel event tied to the exhibition. Uh, the first was a curated walk with Christine Michael, the show's curator, and some of the artists. Uh, if you have not already had a chance, you can find that curated walk on our Instagram page. The link uh, of our Instagram page and the show will be shared in the chat section shortly. Uh, before we begin, just a few housekeeping matters. Uh, this webinar will run about 45 to 50 minutes with brief presentations from each of our panelists. Uh, there are no slides for this webinar. It's just a conversation and a discussion. Uh, if you are using a mobile phone, you may want to orient it in the landscape mode. Uh, that will give you a wider view. Um, if you are on a desktop or a laptop, you may want to maximize your Zoom window, again, to give you a better view. Uh, if you have any questions, please place them in the Q&A box, not the chat box. Uh, they will either be addressed uh, as we go on through the conversation or at the very end. And uh, so that you know, this webinar is being recorded. With that, I'd like to introduce our distinguished panel, Christine Michael, Anjani Khanna, and Mudita Bhandari. They will guide us through the evolving landscape of ceramics in India. Christine will provide a brief history of the field, focusing on key inflection points. Anjani will discuss her involvement with the Indian Ceramics Triennale, highlighting the tri Triennale's role in promoting ceramics. And finally, Mudita will share her experience in the ceramics world, considering both the challenges and opportunities for the future. So by offering insights into the past, present, and future, we aim to spark further curiosity into this wonderful medium. Since we have quite a diverse audience, I thought I'd take this opportunity to give you a brief overview of Art Heritage, which is a commercial gallery that is located in New Delhi, India. Art Heritage was started in 1977 by the late Roshan and Ibrahim al -Kazi. Our current director is Amal Alana. Rooted in education, our founders utilize the gallery space not only to showcase young and emerging artists, but also to expand the boundaries of fine art, including underrepresented mediums like photography, printmaking, and ceramics. In regards to ceramics in particular, since the late 1970s, the gallery has exhibited works from pioneering artists, including Nirmala Patwardhan, Himmat Shah, P.R. Daroz, Jyotsna Bhatt, Devi Prasad, B.R. Pandit and his son Abhay Pandit, G. Regu and Ira Chaudhary, among many, many others. Beyond exhibitions, Art Heritage fosters engagement through scholarly endeavors. Our annual and show-specific catalogs feature seminal articles by both artists and scholars in the field. Examples range from Devi Prasad's educational piece in 1997, entitled My Kinsman, Common Clay, to Dr. Naman Nahuja's essay, The Pandit Studio, Another Indian Modern in 2018, and of course, Christine Michael's uh, essay in our current catalog for the exhibition. Essays provide contextualization and deep analysis of the ceramics landscape and artists practice. This webinar serves as yet another platform with which Art Heritage continues our core philosophy of our co-founders and champions the cause of ceramics. So with that, let's now delve into the discussion starting with Dr. Michael's historical perspective Dr. Michael is an independent ceramic artist, arts educator, researcher, and curator based in New Delhi. Some of her recent curatorial endeavors include multiple realities, Indian contemporary ceramics at the Clear Gimei Museum in Korea in 2023, and tempered poetry in glass with the Inco Center in Chennai in 2022. Recent projects at Art Heritage include the firing line in 2022, and of course, the current show, Shape Shifting Fluid Geometries and Ceramics, you can see part of that show uh, just behind her, to the left and right of her. She has been the recipient of several distinguished awards, the Charles Wallace Award, uh, the Nehru Trust Visiting Fellowship to the Victoria and Albert Museum, and the Sanskriti Fine Art Award. Currently, she serves as the curator for craft for the Serendipity Arts Festival 2024. So with that, Christine, I'll pass it on to you. Okay, thank you so much, Tarek, and thanks to the Art Heritage for really flagging off this very important conversation about Indian ceramics, you know, today. 
Um, I'm going to take a step back in time to the start of the 20th century to reveal the little acknowledged sort of narrative of transnational modernism in Indian ceramics within the context of a national art history. This, I'm afraid, is something that art historians of the modern movement post-independence have paid little heed to and concentrated on other craft-based practices like textiles, which understandably, because of the emphasis placed on the colonial history of exported textiles and also khadi being a symbol of the, of, uh, the struggle for you know, independence. But however, I do think that the role that pottery has played through Tagore's early Shanti Niketan dream of rural reconstruction and Gandhi's inclusion at Sevagram and also Varda of pottery being a core craft has not received the attention it deserves. This of course has changed within the last eight or 10 years with major exhibitions all over the country and also publications by important art, art historians. So the second key point of influence was the growth of regional artistic practice in specific, specific geographic areas that became important nodes of production in style, in education, ways of working and also standards. So I would like to start with the Delhi Blue Pottery and also Sardar Gurcharan Singh, who after his training uh, there in Japan and his meeting with the important thinkers and movers and shakers of the Minge folk art and English studio pottery movement, Shoji Hamada and Beach, Bernard Beach, he reworked stylistic forms and textures from a Pan-Asian and also Western aesthetics into the Indian vernacular traditions and created the iconic Delhi blue glaze. And with this, he made architectural jalis and murals and a range of products that were so vital in the early years of independence and the building up of a new urban lifestyle. Now, in his role as also one of the presidents of the All India Fine Arts and Craft Society, we can see the building of new institutional frameworks coming into being of patronage, of sort of collections, of exhibitions and spaces that actually modern ceramic artistic practice. And this was achieved through his founding of the All India Studio Potters annual exhibition and prizes. And his, you know, sort of Delhi Blue Pottery has continued with the tradition of annual large exhibitions, even after his passing. And this has resulted in seeing every year the steady growth of artists in the field. They have also continuously supported terracotta craft from all over the country. Now, other artists of his, of his generation, or maybe slightly younger, also you know, studied with Bernard Leach in England. They also studied with Daniel Rhodes at Alfred University uh, at the UN, at the US, excuse me. So the second regional, you know, practice that I would like to talk about is of course Pondicherry's Golden Bridge Pottery by Ray Mika and also Deborah Smith, which was another such very important regional nodal point that integrated Japanese aesthetic with an international sensibility using an oriental style firing and glazes for both production wear and individual artistic works. Through their student program that grew immensely over these years, creating a strong work ethic and quality standards. The hub of Pondicherry as a pottery haven for artists and students became internationally known. Annual specialist technique workshops were held with some of the finest artists from all over the world, which really added into the knowledge about the art and craft of ceramics, as well as the international styles and contemporary trends. The institutional degree programs at the schools of art of Calcutta, Shanti Niketan, Madras, Bombay, the NID, the IDC ceramic design programs, BHU, and the MSU Faculty of Fine Arts, besides, besides Bhopal's Bharat Bhavan, became avenues for training a number of designers and artists, with, which further slowly expanded the actual numbers of you know, practitioners. The studio started by the LKA here in Delhi, Lucknow, Madras, and also Bhopal's Bharat Bhavan were havens for the young graduates who could not afford to start their own studios as soon as they had left their MFA. So these were literally stay safe stepping stones to test waters 
while trying to find one's own aesthetic palette. I would add that in all of these educational centers, there were also the sort of traditional models, teaching students their craft, as well as being studied. So their traditions were also documented and also developed by artists and designers for creating newer products for expanding urban markets. There were many craft sort of promoters working in this area around the country, such as Dastagar and Hanover Handicrafts Board and the Crafts Museum, uh, Dilly Hart, etc. Few of the traditional potters bridge the gap between the vernacular and the studio pottery in their second generation and worked a lot in sort of collaboration with other artists, creating newer categories of art. And this brings me to the third key point of the market. Where was all this work that was, was being produced on different levels of firing or glazed or not, or functional or else, you know, sculptural being sold? Well, the market was there at various levels of society, but the understanding of the work and the technicalities and the years of practice needed to achieve this fluency of form and surface was slow in coming. The idea that it was not a one-off object and was being reproduced almost identical, even though by hand with great speed, became drawbacks in the pricing of functional wear. Also, the pollution stigma remains in the subconscious of our people. For, you know, terracotta, it's a one-time use object. And porcelain, which uses calcium phosphate, is really considered non-veg. So in any case, the fine art sculptors, for the fine art sculptors, really terracotta was always considered a waste medium, as it was discarded when bronze was being cast. And I think from fellow fine artists as well, it was a medium that was not taken very seriously. Well under the 90s, despite India having such a strong tradition of architectural and figurative um, flavor. So the Lalit Kala Academy and the National Gallery of Modern Art was slow in also recognizing ceramics along with printmaking and also photography at a national level as a fine art. This only happened in the 80s and impacted the fine art world as well. And there were very few galleries at that time, like of course the Art Heritage, Sakshi, Simloza, who included ceramic artists in their annual shows. There was also support from, from places like you know, the sort of Max Miller Bhavan and the Alliance Francaise and the British Council around the country, which provided avenues to display new creative works. The new booming potter's markets in various cities around the country now, today, over the last three or four years, are a testament, in fact, to the growing fascination for the medium and cater to a gift market at a different level to the gallery space. And I think post-COVID, there has been a greater emphasis on, you know, well-being and also working with clay as a part of the slow movement. And this has been one of the ways to sort of de-link from all of those devices that one got trapped into during COVID and to work with your hands. Now, all these shows and all these, you know, spaces were supported by artist statements in brochures and also critiques within the press, which added to the growing general public knowledge about the medium. And a few artist-run magazines have started within the past, from Bombay as uh, well as Delhi, which brought the community together and shared practice and also technology and techniques. I am currently the co-editor of the new Mrin magazine of the Indian Ceramic Art Foundation. And our fourth issue, which will be out in August, has again about 15 contributing authors who are all artists and who are learning to articulate more confidently about their work and their practice. And artists like me are also becoming curators. So I think we have good things to look forward to. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christine. Uh, that's a wonderful broad overview. I think it gives people a nice foundation uh, upon which uh, our next conversation can go. And that's uh, by Anjani Khanna. Uh, Anjani is a ceramics sculptor, curator, and writer. She is a co-founder and co-curator of the Indian Ceramics Triennale. She also serves uh, as the director for the, the Contemporary Clay Foundation, was the science editor for Down to Earth magazine and assistant director at the Center for Science and Environment in New Delhi. She has an MA from the University of Cambridge and studied ceramics with Ray Meeker at the Golden Bridge Pottery in Pondicherry 
and has been an artist in residence in the US, in Europe, Australia, China, and of course in India. She is the recipient of a number of awards and fellowships, including grants from the India Foundation for the Arts, a senior fellowship from the Government of India, and she is an Art Think South Asia Fellow. Anjani was on the selection committee for award for the 2021 edition of the British Ceramics Biennale. Her work has been shown both nationally and internationally and is in a number of public and private collections. She's a member of the International Academy of Ceramics in Geneva. So with that, Anjani, I'd pass it on to you uh, to look at your work with the Indian Ceramics Triennale and sort of uh, the reason, of course, we picked this was because we've had two recent editions in the last few years. So with that, I'll pass it on to you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tarek. Thank you, Art Heritage. Thanks, Christine, for inviting me to come on board. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm going to speak a little informally about how uh, the Triennale sort of uh, came about. We, are, we were a group of about six uh, artists. I mean, Christine has articulated the sort of the growing uh, ceramic movement in India, but around, we've, we've, around 2000, we sort of, you know, started working together. Um, a number of us, about three of us who were on the curatorial team started working together in 2000. We felt a sense of sort of disquiet about where things stood with uh, Indian ceramics, or at least with felt that our practice, because of this whole tension between, uh, you know, the understanding of the functional, we were all trained as potters and had slowly moved into uh, uh, sculptural work as well. And there was this tension of the, uh, of the understanding of what is ceramics. We wanted to push boundaries. So we started fairly early trying to push boundaries. And in uh, 2000, we got a grant from the India Foundation for the Arts. And we actually, you know, went out and created a public art sculpture, um, a sort of an installation which was placed for a month outside the National Gallery of Modern Art. Um, and this was a collaborative project between four of us. And uh, the whole idea was to push boundaries, push our own practice and to have ceramics being seen in a different light. So it started from there really. And subsequently uh, we've had opportunities to, you know, work together. And we've also, we were in China in 2013. Mudita might mention some more about that. And we were 17 Indian artists working together in China. And that was a real eye opener because there was all of us seeing each other work together, there was, you know, so you've got a sense of people's practice and where they were at. And uh, when it came a few years later, again, as these things happen, it's, you know, conversations with friends amongst ourselves. And we said, you know, we need to push further and do something, um, something more. And uh, so the idea of the Trenale was born basically around 2016 or so. And uh, we, the idea was to create a platform uh, which would really showcase ceramics, what was happening in ceramics in India, as well as in other parts of the world. I mean, that was our ambition to try and bring together on a common platform, different, you know, chat, the first edition we called Breaking Ground and it was held in Jaipur at the Jawahar Kala Kendra, which is an iconic, uh, institution. I mean, it's a wonderful space designed by um, our renowned art architect, uh, Charles Correa. And uh, it really was a wonderful space. In itself, it was inspiring. And we had works there from 47 artists, um, a number of whom were from um, across the country. We, they were invited through an open call. Most of them came to us through an open call. There were international artists who were invited in to participate. And um, the idea really was to sort of, you know, look at practices which are pushing, like we, uh, you know, are pushing boundaries. So we were looking at practices that were exploring scale, that were, um, you know, involved with that involved technology that broadened the whole idea of clay and ceramics, not only looking at fired clay, but also looking at unfired clay practices, looking at traditional practices, looking at ephemeral practices, I mean, works that would just disappear and not, you know, be around after the show was over or that was part of the process of the artwork. Uh, we looked at film, we looked at film as 
um, you know, film as the art itself. And uh, so that's where we, that was the first work, uh, sort of uh, Trinale that we did in Jaipur. And it was extremely well received. It really sort of, even for ourselves, it was, uh, you know, it really, seeing it all together, it was very exciting. And um, so su subsequently, uh, you know, the next edition came around, COVID came in the way, and then the next edition came around in 24. So from 18 to 24 was when the next edition happened. And we moved venue to Delhi. And uh, really, we again, this time we put out a call, but uh, we put out an international call this time around. Um, and, you know, with the call, you get to see artwork that you would not know about the whole, uh, you know, it really opens up for the curators as well. So you respond at some level, you have, a, you have an idea, but the, you respond also to the way um, artists respond to the call. And, you know, we, you sort of uh, create, pick up artworks that, and again, the difference between um, both the editions of the Chenale and um, sort of uh, the whole idea, in, in, as far as we were concerned, is to sort of look at project-based practices. Don't, we weren't asking artists to give us uh, completed works when they would apply. We were asking for ideas and project-based practices uh, so that we could then, you know, engage with the artists, the curators would engage with the artists and sort of uh, the work would develop over a period of time in engagement, in conversation with the curators. And um, so we, you know, it's not like you're bringing a bunch of objects and putting them together in a sense, but you're actually working on, uh, on sort of putting the whole exhibition together. And of course, the Triennale is much more than just the exhibition. So basically, I mean, the intent is really to showcase different practices as well as to encourage artists to push themselves. And uh, the Trinale from one edition to the next is sort of, um, is evolving in itself. Um, it has uh, led to sort of, um, you know, we've encouraged artists to interact with other practitioners in this particular, in the last edition, we had practitioners who were not necessarily only working in clay, but who were working in other media as well. Um, so there was a lot of interesting work that came out there. I mean, that was shown. There was, uh, we also had uh, pra uh, traditional artists who uh, were working in contemporary ways. And um, so there was that angle as well. There were artists who were, like I said, working in different media. You had a combination of technology. Uh, you had sound, you had technology, you had performance. So there was a lot of different sort of uh, ways of bringing in different pra uh, ceramic practices. And that was really our curatorial uh, focus that, you know, we want to broaden it, but we want to bring really interesting, good quality work uh, to India and to create the Chirale as a sort of platform which would encourage that on a long-term basis. So, uh, yeah, so I think that's uh, what I would like to say. And, um, yep, so, uh, you know, and like I mentioned, residencies for one. Uh, we are also looking, we, um, you know, we would encourage, uh, we had a very interesting residency, for instance. We had uh, British uh, ceramic artists who are also musicians. And they were uh, in residence in uh, Mayur, in Artichol, where they were interacting with a ghatam maker and a ghatam uh, performer. So, you know, there was a whole, there were different levels of interaction happening here. So you had makers meeting, you had musicians meeting in, uh, in a context of, or uh, in the context of Mayur, which is, you know, people know is Ravi Shankar's Gharana. So there was all of this, uh, you know, that kind of thing that we want to encourage that kind of uh, interaction and uh, conversation and start uh, new conversations in a sense. So that's the kind of thing that the Trenale is hoping to do and has done and will continue to do. And uh, each edition sort of evolves, uh, grows a little more. Uh, we've had at this time round, we've had, you know, we've had, and of course it's a three month or almost a three month engagement. It's a two and a half month engagement. So there is, uh, you know, there are workshops, there are um, artist lectures, there are, uh, you know, there's 
all of this that adds to the whole uh, whole trinale, basically. Yeah. So I think that's pretty much what I'd like to say. Um, I mean, Thank it is. Yeah, I think that's where I'll end it for now, and then we'll take it from there. Thank you um, so much, actually. I think yeah. just for, for people on the uh, on the webinar, just so that you know, I've posted a link to the Indian Ceramics Triennale website uh, uh, in the chat. So if you're interested, you can always go and check it, check out further details. Um, I think just one question before we move on to you. Yeah, go ahead, Anjan. Yeah, I'd just like to make a point. I mean, the whole, it also is the intention is to provide a platform which is non-commercial, in yeah. a sense, right? So that artists are thinking. Uh, you know, they're not necessarily being confined by uh, uh, by commercial interests and uh, by galleries, and they're free to explore and to develop their um, their artwork. I think that's one of the important points of what we were trying to do. Yeah, and I think that goes in the vein of what uh, Kochi Biennale has also done. Is also trying to do, and any Biennale for that matter, sort of gives us a uh, brings us up to date with where a particular medium is. Uh, every few years. And so that gives you a chance to really understand the progression with which uh, the medium is moving forward. What are the experimentations happening both nationally and as you said in your, in the second edition, bringing in international participants as well. Yeah, so, we had them in the first edition as well, but I mean, this was open call. So it was slightly different to that extent. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Can I just ask before we move on to Mudita, the choice of Jaipur and Delhi, uh, where did those come from? Uh, as you plan the two editions? Well, I guess at some level, we have issues of patronage in India, which, uh, you know, so when we find a patron who's willing to support us, uh, you know, that has been, uh, you know, also, that has also informed our, our, our choices. Uh, so that's really what it is to be quite this uh, and uh, the Delhi space is a new space it was a very contemporary space and uh, we saw it when it as as we saw Jaipur and then neither of them was ready when we saw them uh, they were you know still being renovated still uh, you could see the potential of both the spaces tremendous potential and uh, we said this is you know great and this is where we'd like to go and the Delhi space particularly, I mean, of course, the Jaipur space, but the Delhi space had a sort of sense of quiet. Uh, even though it was in the middle of Okla, it gave you it gave you the kind of space that would, it would you be where you could show the kind of art we wanted to show. You know, it was a, it is a contemporary, really contemporary space. It's steel and, and, and concrete and it's really was really wonderful. It was a wonderful foil for the exhibition, as was Jaipur, as was Jaipur. Okay, thank you for that. I think we'll pick it up uh, as we move forward. Uh, with that, we'll move to uh, Mudita Bhandari. Mudita is a visual artist who primarily works in clay. She received her BFA in ceramics from Kala Bhavan, Vishwa Bharati University, Shanti Niketan, and MFA from the Faculty of Fine Art, Maharaji Sayaji Rao, University in Varudra. Inspired by the use of clay in folk traditions of India, she began working extensively in terracotta. Her Practice is informed by the idea of space and dimension. She is interested in exploring the fluidity of various dimensions and multiplicity of layers within the structure of existence. She's a member of the International Academy of Ceramics in Geneva. Mudita has been invited to various residencies and has exhibited extensively both nationally and internationally. And of course, at the Art Heritage Show uh, that is currently on. Uh, her works are in several collections, including the Marth Rothko Center in Latvia, Pule International Ceramics Museum China, Mehmet Nuri Gosen Foundation of Culture, Education and Art in Turkey, and Bharat Bhavan in Bhopal. Mudita lives and works is in Indore. So Mudita, I'll pass it on to you here uh, to give us a sense of your journey as an artist, your interactions both um, within India, outside India, and how you see some of the challenges and opportunities that the that you as an artist face and the field itself faces. Thank you, Tariq. Uh, thank you for this lovely opportunity. Uh, Christine, thank you for uh, curating such a lovely show. Uh, well, um, so it's been very interesting because I think I find myself very lucky to be, uh, uh, you know, practicing at a time and in a span which is 
really why did it start from a place where uh, ceramics was not very popular in terms of uh, an art form art medium and uh, there were even issues with the um, you know uh, the infrastructure and things like that uh, the availability of the materials and things like that and to come to this point where uh, everything like you order online and it's at your doorstep so it's it's really an amazing span uh, which kind of uh, comes in so i did my bachelor's from shanti niketan and uh, it was more about uh, internalizing the whole thing the uh, the studios were not that the infrastructure in the studio was not very very great but i think uh, we really had a lot of support from the teachers who basically spoke about uh working with whatever is available and building a language of what and how you look at things and how you would want to express so that was uh, and without any distraction because there was not much around that was happening at that time uh in terms of you know a city life or something like that in 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 and around shanti niketan so it was mainly working in the studios being around nature looking at um the local life around with the villagers with the um say the uh, the landscape around there and things like that so that kind of really um uh became the core of uh, it it kind of uh, helped me understand who i am what i relate to so that as overall thing it really became the core of my practice also uh in understanding uh, what i want to express and then i moved on to baroda for my masters and this place was all of a sudden you know uh, very well connected with the world outside so it was almost like coming from an inside space right out in the open and uh, i mean working with different kind of materials uh, they were working with very uh, good high temperature glazes everybody was very very proficient with the medium and stuff like that uh which we had not really done that much in uh, shantini ketan um so it was a mix of that and uh, being able to develop a language of my own in a professional manner uh, in baroda baroda was almost like uh, you know it polishes a student to become a professional art practicing artist they 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 uh, basically you understand how or where you uh, are in the whole structure of things you are able to um, uh, you know find your own space and uh, talk about it so uh, i think baroda was really good in terms of exposure to the outside world because there were lots of artists who were coming christine had conducted a workshop for us where while we were studying and uh, that and then there was ceramic center at that time who kind of gave an, gave us another infrastructure to be able to practice so there were uh, lots of interactions that's where simultaneously we heard about uh, golden bridge pottery as well there was bhu uh, they had a ceramic course uh, which was basically focused on uh, functional pottery with kv jena basically uh, heading that so there were different uh, areas where uh, different kinds of practices were happening so as a student if i want to decide as to what kind of work i want to do and i had a choice of where i would apply or where i would want to go and work further or develop my practice further so um of course like uh, golden bridge pottery was something they had fantastic um uh, you know uh, international exposure because by that time already they were uh, uh, say uh, exhibiting in antika they they were curating shows they were uh, they had a lot of international artists coming in and uh, organizing workshops and things like that and um, i think that happened i finished my masters and then uh, slowly when we start practicing outside it was delhi blue pottery that kind of brought all of these regional institutes together uh, with their exhibitions where uh, you know because they were centrally placed also in delhi so we had like really big exhibitions uh, like mati and uh, tiles forever where all uh, it kind of included the regional practices uh, the ones that were working um, in in say uh, pondicherry or in uh, 
ते बनारस और बड़ोदा और शांति निकेतन दे ऑल काइंड ऑफ केम टूगेदर सो इट वाज नॉट जस्ट इंस्टीट्यूशनल स्टूडेंट्स हु वर कमिंग इन स्टूडेंट्स हु वर स्टडीइंग सिरेमिक्स बट इवन अदर्स हु वर प्रैक्टिसिंग सिरेमिक्स इन द फील्ड दे ऑल वर कमिंग टूगेदर इन दिस एग्जीबिशन एंड इट वाज ऑलमोस्ट लाइक यू नो गेटिंग टू सी ईच अदर्स वर्क नेशनली इन अ प्लेस लाइक अंडर वन रूफ सो um they also had these um, uh, exhibitions called there was one uh, where uh, it was called uh, the golden earth where they invited artists from australia and uh, indian artists so it was a collaboration kind of a thing together we we had a show of uh, work so there was a lot of exposure from that side as well so but somewhere uh, while i was studying um i could sense because i was working with uh, high temperature glazes when i was in baroda and then again i kind of switched back to terracotta because that is a language that i found more uh, relatable to my expression uh, somehow i could sense that there was this whole uh, uh, you know uh, thing about because uh, glazes high temperature was something very new so everybody was fascinated everybody was doing that a lot so terracotta was not really taken as a very seriously as an as a medium for expression which now when i look at the works in chennai i mean it's it's come a long way from where uh, terracotta was not taken seriously or the temperatures of the clay were uh, you know decided as to whether it is a good work or bad work to a point where um you have works where which you know uh where they are melting the clay work in water and that itself is uh a, that process itself becomes the content of the work you know that that itself is the expression so i think um from there to here in such a short time in any case has been fantastic and uh, then other than that we have the potters market like anjini um uh, christian also said that uh, the potters market kind of increased this whole mass appeal of ceramics and people started really the local people people around started getting to know about what ceramic is the interest was created what is very interesting for me i think it will be really nice when all of it kind of comes together uh, like we it it would be really great if more uh, collaborations can be done amongst these separate pockets if all of this can come together i think we can take a huge huge step further also i uh, i think uh, somewhere interdisciplinary workshops or collaborations can do wonders because uh, i was part of one of them which was curated by frank uh, uh, skitman and uh, that was a very very good experience because i was the only one working with ceramics there was no infrastructure there it was in a village and uh, there were other people who were working with different materials so how would you integrate some other material into your work and uh, the processes of it the conversations that happen the ideating of uh, what you creating how else it just kind of expands your vision and your uh, practice way more so um, i think it will be really great if 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 uh if i'm looking at the future the challenges definitely we've had challenges of the material and things like that the infrastructure but somewhere we are kind of coming to a point where all of this is very very easily available and uh, there are uh, many institutes and uh, studios which are offering us places where we can work and things like that but um i feel there is still a challenge of bringing all of this together uh you know uh, as because they are all practices happening in separate corners so it will be great to see all of this coming together and uh, something coming up like like in chennai uh, anjani mentioned that there were uh, collaborations where uh, the music one that that was done in myhar i think that was fantastic um also uh, the work by kate robert um where uh, she used these uh, strings and the clay which is which basically is not a work that that can be sustained or which is going which is actually going to come down when when the work uh, the exhibition is over so it just widens and broadens your idea of things 
uh, of uh, of how you can use the medium it just doesn't remain just a medium but it just kind of takes a step ahead and becomes uh, a way of expressions so yeah i guess uh, that and so but, but yeah uh, i think uh, somewhere the international exposure really helped me a lot as a as a practicing artist because uh, uh, we've been working in india we know the community is not very big so we know everybody we know how they work we know uh, what are the conversations that happen but the minute you step out the conversations are different the context is different the content is totally you know something else so when that breath of fresh air comes in it just kind of changes the dimension of things it just becomes much wider and uh, uh, really helpful in terms of your practice and uh, how you take your work ahead so yes thanks thanks mudita sorry uh, i think i there had some technical difficulties but yeah, i'm back yeah. that's okay um, i think i think one question that i just want to follow up with is um i think what you're saying is it's uh, that going outside the country providing some level of uh, exposure to oneself is very helpful so uh, i think maybe from all three of you uh, maybe starting with mudita i ask as the summer is upon us and people are traveling some of them traveling internationally let's say they're going to europe or the states or going the other side uh, to uh, some place in asia um what would you say in terms of giving oneself exposure where would you say if you find yourself in x make sure you go and check out y do you have any recommendations for people so uh, the way i travel i would really like i think uh, the inspiration can come from anywhere so it's not necessary that you go to a particular museum or a particular uh, area or anything like that i think it's important wherever you're going you spend a lot of time there because um, you know when uh, the kind of travel that generally happens you're going and you're coming back so uh, what had helped me were the residencies where i was spending a quality time in that space in that area in just one place that really helped because uh, like even when we went to china uh, for the uh, this thing we it was a 40 day residency and it gave us a lot of time language was never a problem although nobody we had only one translator between the 17 of us so most of the work even the technical work was done with sign language so a lot of people have this hesitation of going out and doing residencies because language is a problem food is a problem whatever whatever but i think um wherever you go if you're spending a quality time like uh, at least a span a longer span it just gives you a more clear idea of uh, uh, very subtle things that the place can offer it's not necessary it has anything to do with arts or uh, ceramic or anything like that but it can be just uh, in context to the lifestyle of that place and a broader picture uh, i think overall uh when i look at my practice it's a lot of broader picture that kind of uh, comes in and connects with the smaller things in your head or in your daily life you know so yeah so uh, christine or anjani uh, uh, any thoughts on that front and over to you anjani definitely agree with mudita that i mean you know if you immerse yourself in a in a culture and in a space and i particularly i'm done with being a tourist so i'd much rather go to some place and you know particularly a residency or something like that a residency particularly is is very interesting far more interesting even than going for a conference mm -hmm. i think you know if you're working with the material you're working with new materials new people and uh, it, i think you know there anywhere basically wherever you can go and spend a length of time china is wonderful somewhere in, in europe as well i mean it's you know it doesn't it's not anywhere particular mm -hmm. australia you know uh is just you are out of your own context so you you're forced yeah. to look at your own practice as well um from uh, you know from a different point of view and um, and you know it, it, you can only grow from it i think and of course there's the whole, all the opportunities as a 
as a curator of the Triennale, there are opportunities of seeing other people's work, of networking, of, you know, all of that also is, is, is fantastic if you get the opportunity to get out. Yeah. I would like to add two things. One is that just travel within our own country. We have so many areas that we don't even know yeah. um, at, at first hand. This is places within the Northeast, within the South. Um, there are, you know, you know, sort of different communities, tribal communities, other communities um, that have amazing practices of our, uh, of our time of life. So it's not really necessary to go outside the country, but I think even if you travel within the country and, um, you know, are able to, you know, really connect with uh, with different communities, that would also be... Yeah, yeah. Key. The residency that I was talking about, the Shop Art Art Shop uh, in Gunehar, it was a small village, a very tiny village uh, in Himachal, and uh, there was nothing over there. And all of us, I mean, uh, this was basically, this is exactly what, uh, uh, like, even Anjani mentioned and Christine mentioned, that it was one of the residencies which had a very, very deep impact because just the lifestyle of that village, it was so slow, unhurried, uh, relaxed pace, Mm, very intuitive, very, uh, you know, based on your instincts. And all of these things kind of helped me in making my work because, uh, as I mentioned, there was no infrastructure out there. We just had a small uh, sh empty shop, which we were supposed to convert into my studio. So I literally dug up, dug out clay from the mountain and we, I kind of built a uh, kiln and uh, made the work. But the process of the whole thing was almost like you're merging with that space and that space letting you kind of, uh, you know, um, em basically embracing that entire space and time and life. So that I think really in a longer run, it helps you not only in your work, but even in your personal life. So, okay. yeah. Yeah, we have two questions. I'll go with the first one. I think this relates a lot to uh, Anjani, what you were saying about patronage within uh, within the community. I think the question is about fundings for collaborations and how readily available they are. Uh, who who typically supports them, and has it gotten better in recent times? I think the the general the general gist of the question is. Um, how 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 can we build a, a larger support for this community and this medium? Uh, I guess, so if you could address that, and then Christine and Mudita, if you can give your perspectives. Uh, I'll just also note that we're at the 50 minute mark, so if we could keep our responses a little brief. Yeah, I mean, I would love there to be more patronage. It's, it's very hard and, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, people come forward I mean, in this case, uh, you know, Artichol, for instance, offered their space, and, but but the international artists had to get their own funding organized. So it, it, we are not really in a position to organize that kind of thing, but we have connections with people. We know people and we can, you know, put people in touch with other people and things can happen. But uh, there isn't formal uh, sort of, you know, patronage that easily available, you know, um, there are institutions like the Inlax Foundation, for instance, that supported a few, few of our younger artists. But we would ideally like to support all our artists, but we are not in a position to do that. So uh, it is a problem and it is something that we are working on for the future, that, you know, to try and figure out ways of, of sort of uh, making this sustainable. Because at the moment, it, it sort of runs on our energy and on our, on our time, we're all volunteer artists. We are, we're all artists with our own practices. We started off as six, now we are eight. And uh, we all have, we're all volunteers. So it's extremely difficult to, to really pull this whole thing together. And there's, uh, so, you know, patronage would certainly be uh, helpful because, uh, you know, you, and you need a little more structure in a, in a sense. That's for the Trinale itself. But I mean, and so then you can sort of help artists a lot more. I mean, we try to help to the extent that we can help, you know, so, right. but yeah. I think you mean patronage both from the sense of funding uh, from institutions as well as 
uh, uh, development of the on the market side of it because then that creates yes. that balance. There, there is some sort of a balance. There, it's not just uh, uh, work is being created and not consumed. There's sort of a balance that emerges. That's I imagine that's what you're saying. Right, but I mean, you know, we are not a, we are not a gallery, so we are not really involved no. to, to that extent in in the market, if you like. You know, I mean, if an artist was his work gets picked up and it well and good for the artist kind of thing. But uh, but yes, I mean, it is a but you know, we would like to support the artists perhaps you know with a grant or a production grant. We've managed to do that for the younger artists because the Inlax Foundation will support younger artists with mean, very small grants but it still goes a, some way towards you know so you take care of transport you take care of installation those are the ways that we sort of are able to help the artists but uh, certainly if you know if there were more ambitious projects that required funding it would be wonderful to be able to get that funding you know yeah. Yeah. to to the artists yeah christine your thoughts on it I think it's just a pity that there is so little state funding for, you know, sort of ceramics. The pot is very, very small in any case. And then for ceramics, it's even minute. So uh, the um, emphasis has been on private, um, uh, you know, sort of, sort of financial supports. And uh, this is growing, you know, with sort of private museums coming into play. Uh, you know, of course, private galleries, etc., and also the corporate. Uh, I think CSR uh, sort of initiatives uh, is there, but it is a pity that state funding is so is so limited, and I don't see any way that we can really um, advocate for a higher a higher state of funding because if you look at the rural potters, you look at the terracotta potters. Uh, they also don't have funding. So um, we're in a much better place that way, um, I think. But um, however, yes. OK. Uh, Mudita, any thoughts? Sorry, Mudita? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think they've covered it all. Yeah. OK, OK. Um, uh, we have another very specific question. I think, Christine, I'll direct this to you, uh, given that you took us from uh, give, took us to the history uh, of ceramics a little bit. Uh, the question is, is there a place for functional wear potters in contemporary ceramics in India? Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the high standards that have been set by uh, the various teaching teaching bodies, which I had discussed, the noble sort of practices, the regional practices, have all set very high standards of what is good functional wear, how is it made, how is it ergonomic? Um, what about the glazing? Um, I think that yes, it's it's a very strong market, and um, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, I think I the potters' markets have gone a long way, hmm. also. To uh, and uh, and what's interesting is that there are still there are artists now who are finding their own voice as functional potters, hmm. and uh, you know and but they're it's still take is i think it'll take some more time for uh you know but there are certainly a number now who would make really good functional pottery and uh, but you know for for uh, i mean the markets don't maybe perhaps uh, sort of uh, draw those uh, those potters perhaps don't come into the markets anymore because they have now their own clientele and they're selling and the instagram for instance is a great uh, way for people to sell. So I think functional is definitely a, has a space and, and good functional definitely is growing. I mean, there are artists who will use only one type of material and only in work in only in one type, you know, they're not all over the place and they're developing their language, which is really good, I think. Yeah. I think there was also a show uh, recently uh, in, I think uh, the first half of the year, uh, uh, where um, a lot of these functional pottery, there was a section which was uh, the functional pottery uh, part of the gallery. I think it was Art Alive, some uh, a show in Delhi itself. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure about art the gallery, positive. but art, art positive, positive, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Kanjan and somebody had cur curated it. So there were uh, like. Um, 
functional potters in the gallery so i think that that would be very exciting to see if uh, functional pottery can come to the gallery then because but well, uh, i think functional pottery has always been within the gallery if you look at the art pandit if you look at kuchar and singh yeah that way Nata, yes but not so like like this yes yeah. yes but uh, like here they had set up tables and things like that like uh, a full uh, you know uh, proper functional kind of a thing and it was very interesting some of the work was really nice yeah so yeah. good well i mean uh, that's 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 wonderful to hear of course it helps the ceramic field i think we, the question we'll end with uh, uh, is a nice broad ranging question i think it gives an opportunity to sum up this discussion quite nicely which is uh, what impact can you predict that changes to the climate commerce and ai have on ceramics practice in india and internationally for that matter so it's a it's a very broad ranging question certainly looking to the future thank you uh, uh for that question um maybe uh christine would you like to take a crack at it i think i need to process that question <laughs> i can i can just yeah. give me a minute so think about sure, it. Sure, sure. Um, any thoughts, okay. Anjan, from your end or Mudita from uh, your end? No, can, can you repeat it again? Sorry. Sure, sure. What impact can you predict that the changes to climate, commerce, and AI have on right. ceramics practice in India? In India, well. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, commerce, of course, I mean, if, I mean, well, hopefully, commerce will, in, you know, people will be more interested in acquiring ceramics, and that will continue to grow. Um, climate, I don't know. I mean, I don't see. Uh, I have a different take on. Uh, I mean, particularly, I'm a wood firer. I have a different take on on ceramics and uh, and the whole climate debate. Um, I think it's 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 a material. I mean, I think wood is a, a is a renewable resource and I think we should use it and we should fire and we should make pots. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a gentle way to live, I think. And I think that's important. Um, you could do much worse. So um, that's what I would say. Um, and as far as AI is concerned, God knows, I'm afraid I have nothing to add there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think so. Um, yeah. Go ahead, uh, I think uh, somewhere I think clay has also found a place as a therapy. Mm. So uh, I'm not sure in, in context to uh, arts as in uh, fine arts um, in the galleries. I, I can't really say much there. But as ceramics, uh, because uh, there are a lot of people who are not interested in firing the work but are interested in the process and use it as a therapy rather than you know create and it's 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 also the process itself is creating something so it uh, it's not necessary that you're firing it and keeping it as a uh, you know accumulating more in terms of uh, the climate and the environment but uh, somewhere and the like i think it, it it ai can't really replace it because if it's being used as a therapy uh, it's a very personal thing, so it's it's more like really uh, using your hands to do something. So yeah. Well, I, I guess there is. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Anjali. I mean, I guess there there are you know new technologies like three D printing, etc., which we yeah. had even at the Biennale. So I mean, that okay. of course is something that you know will grow. Um, you know, so there are artists who are. 3D printing clay, they're 3D printing uh, the positive and then making molds and then working with uh, with the molds which are 3D printed. I mean, the, uh, the you know, so we had a couple of artists at the Trinale who, there was, who were working with 3D printed molds. You know, so, I mean, that's certainly an area where technology will continue to grow, I think. Yeah, and yeah. that will have an impact, yeah, sure. Yeah. And I think it's a very wide space. Every everything is possible, and everything can survive. I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, Christine, we're up on the hour. Any any thoughts on it, or should we move on? No, that's. I th I think it's uh, been covered. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much to everyone for joining, and of course our panelists, Christine, Mudita, and Anjani. Um, it's been a nice 
a very broad ranging conversation. We hope that it is foundational for, for the people who've had a chance to listen to it. As I mentioned, there's, the webinar has been recorded. And so in time, we'll, we'll uh, launch it on our YouTube channel. Uh, thank you once again. Look forward to seeing you at another Kiln Conversation. Thank you so much. <laughs>